How are you doing so far? Good. Have you been blessed? Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, for the sake of time, now some of you said that you have seen uh, this uh, or heard this presentation before, and um, I just want to warn you that this is not the 38-minute version, if any of you happen to see that. Uh, if you didn't happen to see that, don't worry about what I'm talking about. Um, let's just have a quick word of prayer, and we're going to uh, open the Word of God and see some amazing things. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would please speak to us today, Lord. Uh, feed us with the bread of life, and Lord, may our hearts be moved as we look into your wondrous plan of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are told uh, in the book, uh, Last Day Events, we're told in the book, Last Day Events, that um, under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter days, <clears throat> thousands will be converted in a day. Uh, the same number that were converted, that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, we are told we will see conversions like that, and we will see them happen with a rapidity that will be breathtaking. So my question for you is, how many of you are looking forward to that time when thousands will be converted in a day? Amen. That will be a powerful time because the Spirit of God will be upon God's people. There we are, thousands in the 11th hour will see and acknowledge the truth. These conversions to truth will be made with a rapidity that will surprise the church, and God's name alone will be glorified. Amen? Amen. So, uh, 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 this is good news, but it also presents a very serious challenge. Because when we reason this through, if thousands will be converted in a day, the question is, what are they going to be converted to? We know that they're going to be converted to the preaching of the three angels' messages. What is the three angels' messages all about? Call it out for me, just give me some answers. The three angels' messages is about judgment. What else? It's about worship. What else? Last day events. Uh, what else? Salvation. Come on, help, help me out here. Is, is uh, the Sabbath included in that? Yeah, yeah. How about uh, the mark of the beast? Is it included in that? How about the 2300-day prophecy? Is it included in that? How about the 1260-day prophecy? The 70-week prophecy? How about the fall of Lucifer from heaven? Yes? How about the sanctuary message? Yes? Well, beloved, listen to me. Listen very carefully. If thousands will be converted in a day to the preaching of the three angels' messages, that seems to indicate, beloved, that you and I must be able to share that whole thing in a day. Don't pass out. <laughs> Whoa, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> yes, beloved, if, if these are to be converted in a day, remember, Peter preached one message and 3,000 were converted. And so the question is, how in the world can I uh, get to the place where I can preach the three angels' messages in one day? Is it possible to actually give our entire message, the entire three angels' messages, the entire plan of salvation? Is it possible to do that in just one day? I want to suggest to you that the answer is yes. We're about to do it in about an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to cover the 2300-day prophecy, the 1260-day prophecy, the 70-week prophecy, the fall of Lucifer from heaven. We're going to cover the sanctuary message. We're going to cover the three angels' messages, fear God and give glory to him. We're going to cover the millennium. We're going to cover the second coming. We're going to cover the end of the wicked and earth made new, all in about an hour and some change. Are you excited? All right, so... Um, let me ask you a question, and I always set this message up with this question. How many of you think that um, if I ask you to come up here and explain um, the last movie that you saw? Now, I know that you're a Seventh-day Adventist, so you don't watch TV anymore. But the last movie that you saw, you think you could come up here and explain it in about 20 minutes or so. How many of you think you could do that? Come on, come on, come on, come on, guys. Come on, seriously. How many of you think you could, you could explain a movie that you had seen, whether it was a documentary or whatever it happened to be, you could explain that movie, yeah? Okay? 
Now, if I were to ask you to come up here and explain to us the Bible, <laughs> in about, you know, half an hour or so, how many of you think you could do it? <laughs> okay? This is what we're going to do. Listen, there, there is something very important about the, the analogy I just gave you, and here it is. The reason that we can remember a movie so much is because of the images that have been placed in our minds, right? A picture is worth what? A thousand words. So here's what we're going to do. We're simply going to take images from the Bible. Do you know what a movie is, by the way? Moving pictures. Moving pictures. It's just a bunch of pictures put together, and as you go through them in, with rapidity, it forms a movie. So I have entitled this message, The Blueprint. It's subtitled, Earth's Final Movie. Are you with me? So what we're about to see, beloved, is we're about to watch a movie. Amen? Amen. Now, um, how, many of you, how many of you have ever juiced before? You know what that is, right? When you take a, a, a you know, fruit or vegetable and you, you know, maybe you get like 20 carrots and you juice it down into one cup. That's what we're going to do with the Bible, okay? We're going to juice the entire Bible so that we can cover it. We're going to span the entire great controversy and we're going to do it in such a way that by the grace of God, you will be able to share this message with your friends and your neighbors and your family. How does that sound? Are you ready? All right, so we are going to begin and I'm going to invite you to use your mind as the screen. You will hear me often say in this presentation, are you with me in your movie? And just simply tell me if you are, just say amen. Are you with me? Amen. All right, our movie begins. Have we prayed? Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, please guide us, give us understanding, teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our movie begins with an angel by the name of Lucifer. Now, we understand that heaven was a place of perfect peace and perfect harmony. And uh, uh, all was in harmony to the will of God. In Ezekiel chapter 28, we read about an angel named Lucifer, but he's also called the anointed cherub. Let's read that. Thou art the anointed cherub that, what? Covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until what? Iniquity was found in thee. Now, before we go any further, we want to establish a certain point here. Lucifer is called a covering what? Cherub. Now, in order to understand what a covering cherub is, we would have to go, uh, 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 go to the Old Testament where God had given Moses instruction about building something called a sanctuary. I want you to see what the Bible says here. The Bible tells us, uh, uh, speaking about this sanctuary, that it was the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was an admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou maketh all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So very simply, what this is uh, showing us is that the Old Testament sanctuary was a pattern or a shadow of what? Heavenly things, okay? So when we go to that Old Testament sanctuary, by the way, there's a picture of the tabernacle. How many of you have seen a picture of this tabernacle before, okay? There's a picture of the tabernacle, and we just want to, for the sake of time, we're going to go right into a place called the Most Holy Place. Now, who can tell me what was in the Most Holy Place? The Ark of the Covenant. And on either side of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels, and these angels were called what? Covering angels, or covering cherubs. Listen to what the Bible says here. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, doing what? Covering the mercy seat with their wings. Now, 
uh, we're going to take a picture, look here, at a picture of that ark very close up. Here you have the mercy seat, okay? And then here you had what was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, let me ask you a question. If this picture is a symbol or shadow of heavenly things, then what do you think that mercy seat represents? God's what? God's throne or God's dominion. All right? So here we have the throne of God. And by the way, in the Old Testament sanctuary, the Shekinah glory sat right on that mercy seat. Who is the Shekinah glory? It's God, okay? So we have God on the mercy seat or his throne. And then the, the, what was holding up the mercy seat? The Ark of the Covenant. If my light will work here. There we go. The Ark of the Covenant. Now, question. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God, the Ten Commandments. What does that tell us, beloved? That the foundation of God's throne in heaven was his what? Law. Are you with me so far in your movie? Amen. Amen. That's scene number one. The foundation of God's throne was his law. And now if Lucifer was a covering cherub, that would mean that Lucifer's original position in heaven was one of the angels that stood closest in the presence of who? God. God. Very good. Are you with me so far? All right. Now, the Bible tells us that Lucifer was a covering cherub. Who knows what the word cover means? When you cover something, what are you doing? You are what? You are protecting it. So what was Lucifer's job in heaven? To protect the law of God. Hmm. Now, beloved, this is very important to understand because most Christians do not understand what the great controversy is over. They don't understand what the battle is over, and, and, and it's kind of frustrating when you don't understand. If you don't understand what a battle is over, then you might be fighting on the wrong side without even realizing it. Okay? So what we want to see here is that Lucifer's job was a covering cherub, an angel that was to defend and protect the law of God, which is the foundation of his government and his throne. Does that make sense? You know, if a throne doesn't have law, then what do you have? Anarchy. Now, let's see what happens here. The Bible tells us, the Bible says, we read this before, Ezekiel 28, uh, 14 and onward, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast what? Perfect. Now, why do you think Lucifer was perfect? God created him, but why else was he perfect? Because not only did he protect the law of God, but he kept the law of God. Does that make sense? In other words, you don't protect something that you're not willing to, to keep. But the Bible says that Lucifer was perfect in his ways from the day that he was created until what? Iniquity was found in thee. Now somebody help me out. What is iniquity? Sin. What is the definition of sin according to 1 John chapter 3 verse 4? Transgression of the law. So get this then. Lucifer sinned or transgressed a what? Law. Now, how many of you want to take a wild guess as to what law it was that Lucifer must have transgressed? The very law that he had been commissioned to what? Defend and protect. Are you with me? So watch this then, beloved. When Lucifer sins in heaven, it brings about a war in heaven. Yes? So here's what we begin to understand. That the very first war, the war that set off all wars, was over the law of God. So if the first law was over, if the first war was over the law of God, what do you think the final war is going to be over? Are you with me in your movie so far? All right, so uh, so far so good. The Bible says they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Uh, the Bible goes on to say here. 
All right, we've read that verse already. Now, we need to, 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 to ask ourselves another question uh, to advance us in our, in our movie so far, okay? The question is, we, we understand from the Bible that one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven with Lucifer when he started this rebellion. Our question now is to figure out how it is that the devil was able to cast out one or was able to deceive one third of intelligent angels. Now, how many of you said, if I was in heaven, I wouldn't have been deceived? <laughs> Here is a question. How is it that Lucifer was able to deceive one third of the angels? The answer is an amazing one. We're told here in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, where did he say it? In his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now let me ask you something. What congregation was Lucifer trying to exalt himself over? Congregation of angels. Because this is happening where? In heaven, all right? So it says here, uh, 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 I will uh, ascend, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. By the way, what did Lucifer end up doing to the congregation? He split it. Do you know the first church split? <laughs> Happened in heaven. And what was it over? The law of God. Look at what it says. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, this is absolutely amazing. What is the Most High like? The Most High is loving, is kind, is righteous, is holy. So let's put this together. What was the argument that Lucifer used to deceive intelligent angels? Here's what he said. We don't need a law in order to be holy like God. Okay, we'll try that again. I'll try it over here. Maybe you guys... We don't need a law in order to be holy like God. In other words, it was an argument of self-righteousness. I don't need God to tell me how to be holy. I don't need a law to tell me how to be righteous. I am already holy. I don't need to obey God's commandments. He doesn't have the market on righteousness. We are already holy. It was an argument of self-righteousness. So Lucifer did not say to the angels, hey angels, would you like to be evil? How many angels would have gone for that? Evil, hmm, destroy heaven and... Um, hmm. No, that wouldn't have been deception. Lucifer's argument was, look, we don't need God telling us how to be righteous. I want you to imagine the depth of this deception. Um, do we have any Democrats in here? Don't raise your hand, please. Please, don't do that. Here's why I don't want you to raise your hands. Because Republicans, do we have any Republicans in here? Republicans, go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah. You know, Republicans, you know that the Democrats are, they're just being worked by Satan. We know that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Republicans. Democrats, you know I was just kidding, right? <laughs> we know that it's the Republicans that is just destroying America. We know that, right? Yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> It, isn't it amazing how both Republicans and Democrats think that they're doing what's best for the country? So I want you to imagine the kind of, of, of politicking that was going on in heaven. Lucifer was a politician saying, listen, God's government and his ways need reforming. He wanted to change, what word? Change the government of God. He wanted to do away with the law of God. And here was his argument. Please don't stone me. His argument was this. Too much big government. <laughs> we don't need God telling us every area what we need, what we're going to do, and how we're going to. We don't need God telling us, intruding in every area of our lives. That was his argument. Let us be the rugged, let us do our own thing. Self-sufficiency. 
Wow. <laughs> Where have you heard that before, right? So, beloved, I want you to understand that the angels didn't say, oh, let's just go be evil. They were at first, even Lucifer himself didn't realize what he was doing. Now he is obviously evil. But at then, he was genuinely thinking, I can be righteous without God. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you heard that argument anywhere here on planet Earth before? That we don't need a law in order to be like God? We don't need a law in order to be like Christ. We can be holy and righteous without God telling us how to do it. Have you ever heard that before? It's an argument that was born out of the heart and mouth of Satan himself. Are you with me in your movie so far? All right, so what happens? The Bible tells us that there is what? War in heaven and the devil and his angels are cast out. Now... Uh, we need to ask ourselves a question. Why is it that God, that God did not immediately judge or destroy Lucifer and his angels? Have you ever asked yourself that question? All right, so here's what we're going to find out. The answer is a profound one. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 and 17. Here's what the Bible says. God is laying out a principle, and uh, he's speaking to Moses, and here's what it says. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. Now, basically what it was telling us here is that whenever controversy arose between two people, there had to be a third party. Are you with me so far? You know, if you have an issue with someone and you try to take that person to court and you go to court and you know you're going to win that case and then uh, when they say all rise, the judge is walking in, the judge happens to be the guy you're taking to court. What do you know? There's no way you're going to win this trial, right? So think about it. Let's take this principle. It's a very fair principle. In heaven, how many sides were there to the rebellion? Two. Two. God and his angels, the devil and his angels. Where is the third party? There is no third party. Do you see the dilemma? Do you see the dilemma? Are you with me in movies so far? <laughs> you guys are glued to the screens. <laughs> All right, so, so what is God going to do? How is it, what, what is the, in fact, here's something interesting. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28, verse 17, as Lucifer is being cast out of heaven, Ezekiel 28, 17 says something interesting. It says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Very interesting phrase. I will lay you before kings. The term appears to be synonymous with some kind of judgment. Like God was saying to Lucifer, I'm going to lay you before a group of kings that are going to judge you. The question is, who would those kings be? Are you with me in your movie so far? <laughs> I want you to notice what the Bible says, Revelation 1, 5, and 6, and from Jesus Christ, who was a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from, his own, from our sins in his own blood and has made us what? Kings and priests unto God and to his father. So guess what, beloved? Who would be those kings? Who would be that third party that judges Lucifer? Us. Wow. What a high calling. Amen. What, I, what, I, what I like to say, beloved, is that, is that you are God's jury. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you are his jury. Beloved, let me, can I warn you? Some, can I? Don't skip jury duty. That will not be a good thing if you skip jury duty. By the way, only jurors will be saved. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Listen. Uh, uh, um, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, Do you not know that the what? Saints shall do what? Judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels are you with me so far are you with me in the movie do you see this 
Is it making sense so far? Amen. Very good. So we, when God created Adam and Eve, they were to serve as the jurors. They were the kings. In other words, humanity was going to be the juror. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, what did he give them? He gave them dominion. Who has dominion but a king? Watch this. When jurors are selected, there are usually some criteria in order to be a juror. Notice criteria number one, little or no first-hand knowledge of the crime. Let me ask you something. Where was humanity when Lucifer rebelled in heaven? We weren't even created. So far, so good. Are you ready for this one? Point number two, a juror must be a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> Are you going to make me get excited all by myself, no. just up here alone? Are you going to leave me lonely up here? <laughs> so, so, uh, 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 jurors must be law-abiding citizens. We know that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them with the law of God written upon their hearts. Very good, okay? Number three, a juror must have sound discernment between good and evil. And number four, they must not be swayed by public opinion. Amen. So watch what happens. Lucifer sees the creation of Adam and Eve, and he begins to wonder, okay, are these, huh, are these the ones that ought to judge me? Is this the jury that's supposed to bring me into condemnation? And you know what he does? Let me ask you, if you were a criminal and you had access to the jury, what would you try to do? Oh, yeah. Bribe. The jury. <laughs> and guess what Lucifer does? Just that. He comes to Eve in the garden, and he says, uh, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Uh, you know, after he asked her, you know, did God say you can't eat from every, every tree? Notice what he says. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You shall be as gods. You shall be like God. Uh -oh. Look out. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. How did he deceive the angels in heaven? We can be like God without obeying what he says. The very same thing. He didn't go to Eve and say, hey, Eve, would you like to be evil? <laughs> No, 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 no. He said, Eve, you can be like God. Now, by the way, the word God is the Hebrew Elohim, which means judges. Eve, you want to be a really good judge? You want to really know the difference between good and evil? Eat from this tree, and then you'll be a really good judge. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. So Adam and Eve, they both eat of the fruit, and what happens? They lose their status as law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus comes to the garden, and what do we know? That he institutes the plan of salvation. So now you tell me, what must, what must be the purpose of the plan of salvation? To restore mankind to being law abiding citizens and sound jurors who are able to discern between right and wrong. Guess what? You now understand the entire purpose of the gospel. It is to restore us to being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, the only way that we can be uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven is if we are willing to be subject to heaven's laws. You see, beloved, what we're doing as we study with our, with our friends and our neighbors is we've got to set a foundation for them so that they can understand the, what we share them in further studies. They can understand it in light of the big picture. If they don't see the big picture, 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 
We've got to hang this in memory's hall. Are you with me? All right, so are you with me in your movie so far? All right, now, what we're going to do now is we're going to fast forward a little bit because God has already shown us that he's going to come and, and set a plan in place to restore mankind, okay? And we'll fast forward, and we're going to come down now to the time of Moses. God is about to use a man named Moses. He's about to take a people out of captivity, and who are those people? They are the children of Israel, okay? And God calls the children of Israel because he's evidently going to use them as part of his plan to restore mankind to being what? Sound jurors, law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So what does God do when he calls Israel out of captivity? He gives them a very special gift. What is that gift? It is the sanctuary. Now, I want to share something with you. The Bible says here, Exodus 25, verse 8, Let them make me a what? Sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. Listen, why is this so important? Um, in fact, let's look at another verse very quickly. Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy what? Way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. Now, pause right now. Um, when, Mo, when God came to Adam and Eve in the garden, what was the first question he asked them? Adam, where, where are you? Now, did God not know where Adam was? He knew where he was. What was he trying to get Adam to realize? That you are what? Lost. You are lost. Because of man's rebellion, they were put out of the garden, right? Right? God's plan is to bring man back into his presence. So what does he do? He gives them a map. You're going to make me get excited. Oh, you're going to do this, aren't you? aren't you? He gives them a map. He gives them something called a sanctuary, which, by the way, is a miniature model of God's throne room where? In heaven. So the very same thing. In other words, it's like God saying, listen, if you want to know how my government operates, if you want to be subject to my government in heaven, I'm going to give you a miniature model on earth. <laughs> it's what I call, by the way, how many of you have ever been lost? And um, have you ever like, you know, asked someone, pull over, ask someone for directions, and they're like, oh yeah, sure. You know, you're in a strange place like Hawaii, let's say. And, uh, you know, you're trying to get to, you know, I don't know, Sharks Cove. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know, all you need to do is just go down the street, make a right here, and then a left there, and then just keep going, and, ah, you'll be right there. <laughs> and the guy looks nice. He looks like a friendly guy, and so you trust him. You, you put all your hopes, aspirations. Just believing that he is right. <laughs> and you, you go off driving and you make the left and the right and you do exactly what he said. And you end up someplace else. <laughs> oh, the frustration, right? Have you ever had that happen to you? Oh, what if we had a GPS that was just so accurate we could know all the time, oh, I'm here and I know exactly where I need to go. Beloved, the sanctuary is God's GPS, his gospel plan of salvation. You cannot get lost if you have this blueprint. God has given it to us so that we can know the way back to the Father. Amen? So how do you think the devil feels about this blueprint? Oh, yeah, he must hate. Are you with me in your movie so far? He must hate this thing because God takes the very thing in heaven. He makes a replica of it and sends it down to earth. And the devil's probably going, oh, look, it's down here on earth. And then he hears God speaking to Israel about the sanctuary. And he understands that God has given the sanctuary to Israel to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. This sanctuary contains the plan of salvation to save the whole world. How do you think Satan feels about that? Oh, he's angry. And he realizes he's got to do something. But beloved, before we go there in our movie, you and I need to understand the importance of this blueprint. Are you ready? Amen. All right, so here we go. 
Oh, I, I, uh, ooh, okay, all right. I'm sorry, I just had to get excited by myself for a moment. All right, so listen to this. The sanctuary reveals the presence of God. Now, you'll remember that God said to Moses, let them make me a what? Sanctuary that I may do what? Dwell among them. So as you look at the outer tent of this sanctuary, it was just regular covering, you know, like a, just a plain brown covering. Nothing attractive on the outside. But on the very inside of that temple was the very presence of who? God. Do you know that the sanctuary reveals Jesus Christ? Jesus said when he came, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will do what? I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was his temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his what? Body. You see, beloved, when Jesus came to this earth, who knows what his name was called? Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name what? Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us. You see, as you looked at that baby, nothing spectacular, just looked like a regular baby. But inside that child was the very presence of God. Are you with me? All right, so you're sharing this with your friends and your neighbors, and they're going, wow, I never knew that about the sanctuary. Are you with me? Look at what it goes on to tell us. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door of the sheepfold or into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Do you realize that's the door he's talking about? Jesus is, is, he says, I'm the one that walks through that door and he walks through that door because he is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He said, Pastor, lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Listen, right up here in that outer court of the sanctuary, there was something called the altar of sacrifice. You know what happened there? Animals were sacrificed. What does that point to? It points to Jesus Christ. He walks through the door, and through the door, he goes to that sacrifice. So Jesus says, listen to this, the Bible tells us, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. When he putteth forth his own voice, he goeth before them, and the sheep do what? Follow him. So, beloved, listen, if Jesus is in the sanctuary, if he walks in the sanctuary, then what will his followers be found doing? following him in that pattern are you with me jesus says i am the way but psalm says thy way O god is in the saint that means jesus is in the sanctuary are you with me all right let's see how else this sanctuary points to the plan of salvation now here, is, here are the articles of furniture, and I just need you to help me out here. Most of you should know this, so help me out. In the outer court is what we call the altar of what? Sacrifice. And then uh, if you moved up a little bit further, you would see an article of furniture called the laver. That's where the priest would do what? Wash their hands and their feet because they were either mingled with blood or dirt. Please, don't lose this here, okay? Uh, what about the uh, table of showbread? This, by the way, was a, a compartment called the, the tabernacle proper, and it was a two-compartment room divided by a curtain, okay? So in the holy place, that's the first compartment, there were three articles of furniture. There was a seven-branch candlestick, and what did that seven-branch candlestick, what do you think that represents? Well, it represents light. It represents light. In fact, Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. So that seven-branch candlestick represents the people of God, the light of the world. We are supposed to be like a city set on a hill. Are you with me? What do you think the, the uh, labor represents? Water. It represents what? Baptism. What do you think the altar of sacrifice represents? The death of Christ. What do you think the table of showbread represents? Man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How about the altar of incense? 
altar of incense represents prayer. According to Revelation chapter uh, 8, verses 1 through 3, that incense, you know how incense just rises? You burn it and it rises? Just like our prayers. When we pray, it rises to God. Amen? All right, so you have the altar of incense, and then you went into the most holy place, and there you have the Ark of the Covenant, the two angels, the covering cherubs, the mercy seat, and the very presence of God. Are you with me? Now, I want you to watch this here. Uh, we have the altar of sacrifice, we have the laver, we have the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the seven branch candlestick, and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, do you realize that if you were to trace around these articles, just draw an outline around the articles, do you know that you would find a cross? You're really going to make me get excited. Alone, up here. Thousands of years before Christ would come upon the scene, the sanctuary pointed to the fact that he would die on a cross for our sins. Amen. Not only that, beloved, but if you look a little bit further, you will notice that in every place that an article of furniture is, Jesus was wounded. How? Jesus had, was nailed in his feet. He was nailed in the left hand, nailed in the right hand, a crown of thorns on his head, He died from a broken heart. And do you know what happened when the Roman soldiers came to him to see if he was dead? They took a spear and pierced his side. And guess what came out? Water and blood. Just as the priests, whose hands mingled with blood, would wash at the laver, Every article of furniture points to a place in which Christ was wounded. Amen. What are the odds? What are the odds? How about this? The sanctuary points to the fact of who Christ is. We know, beloved, that Christ is the Lamb of God. Are you with me? Yeah. Altar of what? Sacrifice. Not only is he the Lamb of God, he is the water of life. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Not only is he the water of life, beloved, he is the bread of life. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> He's the bread of life. Not only that, beloved, he is our intercessor. Yeah. Not only is he our intercessor, he is the light of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And beloved, if that weren't enough, he is the law of God personified. Do you see how important this blueprint is? Let's do some more. Christ, or I'm sorry, we're going to look at the Exodus, and we're going to notice that Christ delivers his people through this pattern. You say, how, Pastor? Listen, in the Exodus, the first thing that God commanded the children of Israel to do was what? They were to kill a lamb. What article of furniture are we looking at? The altar of sacrifice. That's the Passover. You with me so far? Amen. Okay, next. After the Passover, the children of Israel go and they are confronted with the Red Sea. Amen. 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 Do, do you see this? What does the Red Sea symbolize? Baptism. Baptism. After the Red Sea is parted and they cross over the Red Sea, the Bible says in the very next chapter, chapter 16, the Bible tells us that God rains down manna from heaven. Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you see what God is doing here? He's leading the children of Israel through a pattern. Watch this. In Exodus chapter 17, or I think it's Exodus chapter 19, God says to Israel, Israel, you are now my royal nation, my peculiar treasure, my city set on a hill. He is referring them, he is referring to the seven branch candlestick. He is about to use Israel as the light to the whole world. In that same chapter, God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel to take three days to prepare themselves to meet God. 
What article of furniture are we looking at? The altar of incense. Heart preparation. Why? Because in Exodus chapter 20, You thought I was making this up? <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, what happens? God speaks the commandments to his people. Do you think this is coincidence? Absolutely not, beloved. All right, we're going to run through some more. I just want you to get this blueprint nailed down. I want this picture needs to be hanging in memory's hall. Are you with me? Repetition deepens the impression okay so let's look at another one let's look at a couple more here Christ's life this is beautiful where was Christ born but where in Bethlehem in a stable what's in the stable animals Christ was born among animals what article of furniture would you point to to represent Christ born among animals the altar of sacrifice. We might say that Christ was born a living sacrifice. He was born to die. At the age of 30, what happens to Christ? He's baptized. That's the labor. Question. What happens after Christ is baptized? The Bible says he is led up into the wilderness. How many times is Christ tempted in the wilderness? How many articles of furniture do we have? <laughs> What's the first temptation? <laughs> Turn this stone into what? Bread. Do you think the devil is aware of this blueprint? I mean, you think this is coincidence? Okay, watch this. Temptation number two. He says, throw yourself down from this cliff and call out to God. He's trying to tempt Jesus to offer a presumptuous prayer. The altar of incense. Temptation number three. He says, look, I know you came for your people. I know you've come to redeem your people. I'll give you your seven-branch candlestick if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus overcomes all three temptations and he goes on to preach the law of God combined with the mercy of God. Amen? Amen. Are you with me in your movie so far? Very good. Okay, just please, just, just, let's just do a couple more. Let's